Thank you for joining us for our first Hurricane Milton recovery update. I'm Mayor Ken Welch. I'm honored to be joined by our St. Pete City team. I also want to thank State Representative Michelle Rayner for joining us uh, as well. As of this morning, Milton has moved offshore after making landfall in Sarasota last night around 8.30 p.m. The city is in the early stages of the recovery process and has been fully staffed here at the EOC for the last 24 hours to ensure that we could begin the rebuilding process quickly. As soon it was, as it was safe to do so, our police officers began the first push of assessments around 3 a.m. this morning. We also currently have city crews conducting damage assessments and working to clear roads. While we were spared the brunt of this storm surge in this storm, we didn't achieve the level of storm surge that was predicted. We still have serious issues that we're working to address. The storm still brought approximately 18 inches of rain and some localized flooding. The storm also caused damage to our potable water systems, our drinking water systems, infrastructure, and power. But we're actively working to restore those services to residents as quickly as we can. I want to ask that you stay off the roads as our crews start the recovery process by conducting damage assessments. We really need folks to stay in place today and allow them to do that work. We're working as quickly as possible to make it safe for everyone to venture out. And I know folks are anxious to get back to their homes to check out damage and to start cleaning out debris, but please be patient. This is for your safety. The roads are very dangerous at this point and crews are working to make them passable. The more space our crews have to do their work, the faster we can restore services to our community. Now, during the storm last night, we made the decision to shut down the northeast and southwest sewer treatment facilities to protect city employees and prepare for possible damage from storm surge and wind. As of this morning, I'm pleased to report that both of those plants have been brought back online. That means folks can start draining water in their home, like flushing toilets and brushing your teeth. However, due to waterline breaks, we also had to shut off drinking water last night, around midnight. Crews have been out this morning making repairs to the drinking water system, and potable water is back on and may come out of your sink. As the system continues to pressurize, however, it's very important to boil the water before you use it. So we have issued a boil water notice. We're working to identify the location of the water line break, and we have multiple crews conducting ground and aerial surveillance so we can repair the leak and fully restore services. And this is why we stress that folks should stay off of the roads as city teams need that space to ensure we can restore services to residents as quickly as possible. In terms of electric service, we have nearly 400,000 people without power in Pinellas County right now. It will take longer to restore power, but we are working alongside Duke Energy to ensure that we can repair those systems as quickly as possible. Duke is working to bring crews in, but we just need everyone to be patient right now due to um, the impact and the number of outages that we are dealing with. This was an unprecedented storm with very high winds. The damage to the power system uh, is more severe this time around. Many residents uh, across our city team are impacted by this storm as well. Uh, so we're asking for everyone to be patient while these services are being restored. I do want to thank our local, state, and federal partners for the support they provided to us during this time. We've been in contact with them across all levels, and they've all been great partners who are focused on helping St. Pete rebuild. This was a storm that intensified quickly and gave us very little time to prepare. But we made it through the storm, we have started the recovery, and we will be successful. I ask that everyone continue to be patient and lean on each other during this time, be a good neighbor, offer help where you can, and know that we will come back from this 
challenged, stronger, and more resilient than ever before. Thank you all. We'll now take any questions you might have. Well, you know, I, th I thank my team for being proactive, uh, identifying that risk and getting notice out to the folks in the affected areas. Uh, I don't know if uh, James or Don wants to come and give us any details on that, um, but I'm glad we were able to proactively from the city side um, warn folks about that potential danger. Don Tyre, introduce yourself, please. Don Tyre, city building official. Uh, yeah, we were in contact with both the contractor and the developer. Um, the uh, T-crane section that fell was the 500-foot section. The 600-foot section is still intact. Um, they are flying an engineer in to uh, certify the two remaining cranes before they put them back in service. That's going to be a mandatory requirement. Um, the crane that, that did fall, uh, it seems like it snapped off just above the unbraced section of length, uh, above the roof section of the, uh, of the 400 Central Tower. Uh, the tiebacks seem like they're intact, so, you know, it's definitely a wind gust that took off the uh, section of the tower with the jib crane, and uh, that's what struck the uh, Times building. Um, it's kind of wedged into the uh, fifth floor there, the fourth floor, um, so it's, it's somewhat secure right now, but the winds still are gusting, uh, you know, 40 to 50 miles an hour. Um, they're going to need a portable crane to remove that section, and then they will, you know, torch the uh, remaining section and cut it up to, to clear the road. That's probably going to be a few day process to get mobilized to, to, to take that, you know, uh, and to complete that work. Um, this is the developer's responsibility. Um, you know, they obviously have liability insurance to, you know, protect the surrounding buildings. Uh, and that information can be made available to anyone that needs to make a claim. When was contact first made with the contractor and the, devel the developer? A after the incident or? Yes, yeah, so um, the first contact, my uh, inspection team, usually when a storm starts forming, uh, we send out all the teams to residential and commercial properties to do uh, hardening, you know, the construction sites for flying debris and things like that. Mobilized cranes, the, the portable cranes are easy. Uh, they can remove them from the side or just drop the boom uh, to make them secure. The T cranes, it's, it's another issue. Um, we actually issued an order, um, I, I believe it was Saturday, to, to try to remove those upper sections. And uh, we were just, they, they just found out there's just not enough time. They, they would have had to fly in a crew, they weren't available, and it usually takes a few days to a week to plan for disassembly of that section. Um, as the building goes up vertically, as they build the crane, those cranes erect themselves. And uh, when they do a crane jump like that for a few stories, that work usually takes about a day and a half to complete. But, you know, a few days prior to that to plan it and get the crew mobilized to do that. So there really just wasn't enough time to dis disassemble those sections um, with the rapid intensification of the storm. Is that the only crane that fell? Yes. Yes, that's the only crane that fell. Uh, the other cranes, uh, they vary in wind speed, but you know, somewhere between 140, 145 mile an hour uh, design wind speed uh, for the other uh, three sites. Um, the, the, I'm sorry, the Red Apple Group, though. Um, you know, you have to remember too, it's not just the wind speed; it's the height. So wind gusts are much higher the higher you go up. So those those cranes were five to six hundred feet. All the other cranes were were much lower. Is anyone hurt? As far as we know, no, no one was hurt. How far did the crane fall? Um, actually, it just basically went over First Avenue South. So, you know, that right of way is probably approximately 100 feet wide. Um, it, truthfully, I mean, it was a devastating thing when it fell. But with a failure like that, it's probably the best case scenario. Um, if it would have pulled the entire tower off, it would have probably fallen about six to 700 feet away and, and probably impacted a number of different buildings. Well, the developer is responsible. He, they're the responsible party as well as the contractor, but there's really no regulation that we have locally in place to 
you know, dictate that you have to use a certain design wind speed for your cranes. Um, that's something that we could definitely look at in the future. But you have to remember this, this is an incident that we haven't seen the wind speeds here, you know, 50, 50 years at least, in not recent history anyway. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really just a devastating, you know, event that happened due to the wind speed from the storm. Uh, 100 mile an hour wind speed is basically not heard of in recent history in this area. Can you just talk about the overall damage that is in St. Pete right now? I mean, even on the way here, I was talking power lines that were in, just so we can let people know why they shouldn't be on the streets, you know, power lines can be hot or can become active, but just an overall picture of, of what the crews are, what you guys are encountering. Do you want me to touch it? We're good. Just okay. On every street corner. Thank you. Our uh, Housing and Neighborhood Affairs uh, Administrator, Amy Foster, will speak to that. I just want to uh, speak to that last question on the um, what should be in place for these cranes. And as Don said, one of the things we can look at is what we can do on the regulatory side to require that those cranes be able to withstand, you know, higher wind speeds from hurricanes. We have to inform our policies going forward based on the new reality. Same thing with, you know, the um, hardening of our infrastructure for our sewer plants, for example. You know, we talked about a, a current project that's underway at the uh, northeast plant to raise it so it can withstand uh, 11 feet of storm surge, a $70 million project, great forward-looking project to raise that standard. And now we're seeing storm surge come in 15 feet predicted. So we need to look at our total capital programs going forward to make sure they match the threat that sea level rise is presenting to us at a much faster pace than we anticipated. So, Amy. Good morning, Amy Foster, Housing and Neighborhood Services Administrator. Um, we haven't been out on the roads long this morning, but we are assessing the damage in order to determine where our most vulnerable communities are and where we will need to um, put out comfort stations or points of distribution or other ways to care for our residents as they recover from this incident. Um, certainly there are a lot of down trees, there's a lot of down power lines. We didn't even make it through most quadrants of the city yet. There's hundreds of um, city staff that will be out on the streets um, working these assessments. We'll also need residents to report things via C Click Fix so that we can get out there. Um, I can report that sanitation will not um, be conducted today. They are assisting Parks and Rec and the Forestry Department with doing our first push at this time. But we are hoping that maybe later today or tomorrow we'll be able to um, share more about that and the damage assessment teams will be out on the road as well. Sure. Uh, good morning, Tony Holloway, Chief of Police. We received two fatalities. Uh, one was a medical. The other one was uh, someone that was found in a park waiting to uh, get the uh, medical examiner to give us cause of death. You know, two people lost their loved ones, so, uh, so we did lose two people during the storm. As far as people being transported to the hospital, I'll have the uh, chief cover that for you. Uh, Ian Womack, St. Pete Fire Rescue. Uh, we're still working through our call queue. As you guys know, we had to uh, come offline from 911 responses as the storm conditions worsened. We started to work on that call queue around 5.30 this morning. We're still working through that. I don't have definite transport numbers, but I know we have about 50 calls, high priority calls we would classify queue that we started working on at six o'clock this morning. Overall, from when we opened our sub center, we've had about a thousand calls since then. Uh, notably, that's a little bit of a smaller volume to your specific point about how it would compare to Helene, and we, we do attribute that to the public doing well, listening to the evacuation orders and getting themselves out of harm way, and that's made a huge difference in our ability to address the people's needs that are still here. Is that 1,000 since the storm started, just to clarify? 1,000 since we set up our, our sub-center went live, which was Tuesday at 8 p.m. Okay. 
bring up James Corbett, our City Development Administrator. Good morning, James. Good morning, uh, James Corbett, City Development Administrator. So the uh, outer roof and inner roof for the for Tropicana Field uh, was blown off and it blew to the um, south of the of the stadium. So uh, the majority of the the roof has been um, ripped and blown off, and it's it's now located south of the stadium. There, there were uh, some individuals inside. I believe it was about 14 individuals. It was not the first responders and linemen. It was security and other uh, associated groups inside the building, and they were they relocated safely to another part of the building. Was anyone injured at the front? To my knowledge, no. Okay. I, I asked this question on Tuesday. It wasn't answered. What, what, what is the Trump rated for per hurricane? What can it withstand? I do not know that answer. Do you? So when, when Tropicana Field was renovated for baseball, um, they measured wind speed differently. They did fastest mile. Um, so it's, it's somewhere between 102 and 110 fastest mile. Now, three-second gust, you roughly add about 20 miles an hour to that. Um, so, you know, in today's building code, you know, it would be a new, the new stadium would be designed for 145 to 155 fastest or uh, three-second gust. Okay, so is the city involved in whoever staging there, like, to communicate that information that it might not be safe when you were expecting 100 mile per hour winds anyway? Well, I, I believe all the first responders relocated to another facility so they, prior. To, I, I don't have that information. We don't have that information right now. We would support the storm, I assume. We heard that they were there for a Halloween disaster. Oh, Rob, can you help us with this? Good morning, Rob Gerda, City Administrator. Yes, they were coordinated through the state and the federal, uh, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation. I don't know the exact time that they left, but they did pull out before the storm, and that's why there was only the 14 uh, employees of the Rays in the building at the time. Rob, isn't the city still on the hook for capital maintenance for the trial? Um. <clears throat> It's a little bit complicated how the fund works for Tropicana Field, but there is insurance uh, on the property, and so that's the first thing we'll be looking at is, is the property insurance uh, to help make repairs. The new ballpark, that's supposed to only take up to Category 4. Is that going to be revisited to take, be able to take on more powerful storms like a Category 5? I mean, right now we're really focused on our first day of recovery and the health and safety of the citizens of St. Pete, and issues like that we'll just have to wait a little while until we could get to them. The first responders with the state. Not worth planning on staying at the top. Yeah, I'd refer you to, to the Florida Department of Transportation to talk to them. That's who they're with. That, that might be it. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you all for joining us. Stay safe.